Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 82 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're answering weird questions again. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Since this is a fifth Friday of the month, we're going to be doing our regular fifth Friday weird questions based on a Catholic Answers live show. Uh, this time, we're going to be talking about teleporting the Eucharist, parallel universes, uh, ghosts, haunting places, whether uh, space colonists like on Mars would get resurrected with everybody else at the resurrection of the dead, whether angels can appear as dogs and cats, and other interesting and weird questions. Excellent. All right, folks. Well, Hope you enjoy the show, and we'll be back right after it ends. Hello, and welcome to Catholic Answers Live. It's Friday, so let's have a little bit of fun to go with our apologetics uh, today. Uh, This hour, Jimmy Aiken, who it has been at least... 22, 23 hours uh, since he's been in front of this microphone. Uh, we're going to do weird questions with Jimmy Aiken. Uh, I always enjoy weird questions with Jimmy Aiken, Jimmy, because you always come for that. We never get another apologist uh, to do it. That has not happened yet. No. Well, happy to be able to oblige. It would probably be an unsuccessful show, weird questions with Jimmy Aiken, if there were no Jimmy Aiken here. Well, it. it would certainly be different. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess so. I guess. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a generous, generous way to think about it. Uh, 888-318-7884 is our number. But most of the questions we're going to do are uh, from the Internet. So we get a lot of interesting. And I don't want to say that they're all weird, but as a general rule, uh, the total effect of these calls today is our these are just weird questions. Um, and so it's fun to do them with Jimmy. And uh, but before uh, we do the weird uh, questions, Jimmy. We have a, a question that I don't know if it even uh, qualifies as a weird question, but um, it's a good question. So uh-huh. I wanted to get to it. Okay. I'm interested to hear the, the answer. Um, hello, Jimmy. Hello. In Swedish, in the Swedish New Testament, we name Lucas for Luke, Matthias for Matthew, Marcus for John. And Johannes for, excuse me, Marcus for Mark and Johannes for John. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But I am curious what their real original name is in their own language, which I am so excited to hear because that's a great question and I've never thought of it. Okay. Uh, regards from a soon to be Catholic woman in Sweden. Uh, and she also really likes you because you explain everything in such an easy way. Oh, that's very kind. So, uh, and who, what's her name? Um, I'm missing it. Is it, uh, Annika. I missed it. Sorry. Annika. Annika, thank you very much for that question from Sweden for Jimmy yeah. Aiken. So how do we pronounce the names of the evangelists? So it's a little tricky. One of the reasons is because we don't have audio recordings of of people speaking back then. Yeah. And so we can only reconstruct how things were pronounced from from what they wrote down. Yeah. And they didn't have the International Phonetic Alphabet at the time. So that means they were so backwards. Well, you know, recording. uh, Yeah. So uh, as a result, all of our knowledge of how to pronounce these ancient languages is somewhat iffy, you know, and and partly that's also because the people had different accents. They might be speaking the same language, but pronounce it a little a little differently. That's why Peter gets fingered as a Galilean. Oh, right. When he's in. The right. court of Caiaphas. He's got that accent. That Galilean accent. So they right. would have pronounced them a little differently um, from one region to another. Also, there are different variations of a lot of these names. Um, but what I can tell you, I'll tell you the Greek first and then we'll do the Aramaic. OK. Um, so in Greek, Matthew's name is Matthios. Matthios. OK. Mark's name is Marcos. OK. Luke's name is Lucas. All right. And John's name is Johannes. I have to say, those are closer to the Swedish. They are. Than yeah. to, to English. To English yeah, yeah. She, she's pretty close. In, there, Annika. in Aramaic, they're a little bit different. Um, Matthew is uh, either Mate or Mathe. Okay. Uh, Mark, Mark is Marcos. 
and you're pronouncing the Q towards the back of your mouth there, not uh, the K towards the front. And that's in Aramaic. Aramaic. Okay. In Aramaic, uh, Lucas, it also has that Q sound in the back of the throat. So it's like Luca. Oh. And in and then uh, John in Aramaic is, um, in at least in the Pshitta Aramaic version of the New Testament, it's um, Yuhane, Yuhanon. Yohanan, okay. Yeah. Um, one also thing we ought to mention is, so Mark, his Jewish name is also John, but he's called by the Latin name Marcus, except they say it in Greek because they're Greek speakers, so they say Marcos instead okay. of Marcus. I got gotcha. But his name in Latin would have been Marcus. I got you. So do you think that uh, they just picked that one or it's related? No, to no, some other he's, that... he's he's uh, it, it was it, many people at the time had bilingual names because they were living in a bilingual world. And so um, he had his uh, he had his Aramaic name. He would have been called at home by his mom. But his and his father was apparently dead at this time um, because he's not mentioned, whereas Mark's mom is. Uh, but his father presumably was a Roman citizen, which would be why uh, he then had a Latin name. Because typically, if you became a Roman citizen or if one of your ancestors became a Roman citizen, they would uh, take a Latin name at that point, which is why Paul has the Latin name Paulus. Ah, uh, yeah. Even uh, though his Hebrew name is was Shaul or Saul. So when he went home, they'd have called him. Uh, they, the, they probably would have called him. I mean, it's going to depend. Yeah. I mean, even Sting's mom calls him Sting these days. She does. She does. Yeah. Well, um, my mom would not do that. Yeah. If she, I don't think she put up with that. But usually you'd be called by your, your native language name at home. And then yeah. you'd be called by another language name when dealing with people who spoke that language. So it's not quite the hard and fast kind of image we might get sometimes where Paul changed his name. Saul no. changed his name to Paul. No, uh, Saul did not. It's, it's not a it's not a Simon to Peter thing. In his case, yeah. he just had both names. Right. And um, presumably the name Paul was one he inherited from his father or grandfather, who was the first one to become a Roman citizen and take that name. Gotcha. Okay. So I think the, the, the obvious question here, well, maybe it's not obvious, but it strikes me. I would like to know the name of Jesus in those mm -hmm. various. So in Greek, uh, Jesus is Jesus. No, that's really close. Yeah, only yeah. notice it's not Jesus. Every time I teach Greek to uh, American speakers, I have to they say, warn they them because say Jesus. Right. Yeah. In English, when we have an S between two vowels, so it's an intervocalic S. Right. Uh, we tend to pronounce it as Z, which yeah. is why we say Jesus in English. But it's not that rule does not apply to other languages. So okay. in Greek, it's Jesus. Got it. Um, then in Aramaic, uh, Jesus's name comes out a number of different ways, depending on the type of Aramaic you're speaking. Oh. It, um, when I took Aramaic, we were, uh, taught to, um, uh, oh, now I had it in my head a second ago and I'm blanking for a second. Uh, um, but, uh, Ishoa. Ishoa. Yeah. With a okay. vocal constriction and activation of the vocal cords at the end. So Ishoa, but it's also, it comes out differently. Isa, things like that. Um, in our chapel, we have a, a, a divine mercy portrait. And then mm -hmm. the Jesus, I trust in you is in Latin. Uh -huh. And there it's uh, J-E-S-U. Mm -hmm. How would that have been? Yesu. Right now? Um, Yesu. Yeah. Now, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Aiken is our guest. Uh, Jimmy is the author of many things, including A Daily Defense, 365 Days Plus One to Becoming a Better Apologist, and Teaching with Authority, How to Cut Through Doctrinal Confusion and Understand What the Church Really Says. Uh, most of our uh, questions, well, they, all of our questions come to us electronically. Today. Uh, That's today. why we know they're weird. Because we pre-screened them. Oh yeah, that, we have, we have to screen them for adequate. Yeah, weirdness. I have this real weird question: Does, Where is purgatory in the Bible? You yeah, know, did sorry, Jesus have brothers? That and, you know, it wouldn't be weird enough, right? So we go for the real weird one. So uh, can I go to James? Yeah. Uh, from Facebook, then uh, James writes this, <laughs> Jimmy: If teleportation is ever invented, then would a teleported Eucharist still be? The body of Christ. Whoa. It, the answer is going to depend on the type of teleportation that you're using. Um, and there are a number of different 
types of teleportation that have been proposed. One type is you pass through normal space, but you just do it really fast, like too fast to see. Yeah. And as long as the Eucharist isn't injured in that process, it's just moving through normal fa- space just really fast. Yeah. And so it would continue to have the appearances of bread and wine, and so it would continue to have the real presence. Okay. Um, there are other forms of what we might call non-destructive teleportation that have been proposed. Like maybe it, you you don't go through normal space. Maybe you go through like a wormhole yeah. or something or another dimension that maps onto ours in a non-one-to-one way. Yeah. So you're traveling a short distance in this other dimension, even though, and you're not transversing the corresponding space in our dimension. So you like disappear from one spot and appear in another. And as long as, again, the Eucharist is not destroyed in the process of doing that, it's going to retain the real presence. Um, Then there are what you could call destructive forms of teleportation. And the classic one is the one you see on Star Trek. Now, actually, in some episodes of Star Trek, they kind of fudge about, is this really doing what they say or not? But if you decomposed the Eucharist into its subatomic particles, you know, the the subatomic particles that are there in the accidents, then it would cease to have the appearances of bread and wine. And so the real presence would cease at that point. Right. And even if you then reconstituted those fields and particles so that they looked identical on the other end of the process, right. It wouldn't be the real presence anymore because the real presence had ceased and you didn't reconsecrate them yeah. at, to, to bring it back. I, I would not get in that teleporter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's basically a murder machine. That strikes yeah. me as just yeah. killing me and making a new me. Yeah. Sort of. Well, it is, uh, yeah. which is a real problem, which is why they fudge it in some episodes of Star Trek. Yeah. Right. Um, all, and that's similar, even though that one's more science fiction at this point, we do have something similar today known as quantum teleportation, where it's possible to, quote unquote, teleport subatomic particles <clears throat> or even like atoms and stuff from one place to another. But really, it's it it's another form of of destructive teleportation, because what they're doing is they're transferring on the quantum level, they're transferring the information that applies to one set of particles in one place and sort of jumping that information at light speed to yeah. another set of particles that then conform to it. Right. And so it's it you're it's 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 uh, going to end up with the same effect. Uh, that strikes me as a potential one for a very, very long distance instantaneous communication. If you could. Well, it's still light speed limited, so yeah, it's I, not going to be any faster than radio waves. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, maybe one day we'll build an Ansible and we'll have the ability to do faster than light communication. I don't know what an Ansible is. It's a device uh, that allows faster than light communication. Oh, I like it. <laughs> Jimmy is the the host, the creator of um, Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World as oh, well. I don't have that kind of power. Oh, well, you that requires. I didn't say you were the creator ex nihilo. Okay, good. But you are. But you certainly use the materials God already had created. Yeah. Well, I'm dependent on Him. I've noticed that about you. Mm-hmm. You you seem like your entire being is dependent on Him to exist. Very moment to much moment. so. Yeah. <laughs> um. The the thing is, you're aware of it. Mm-hmm. I don't know that. <laughs> Everyone's aware of that. Yeah, it's true. Uh, so uh, moving on with our uh, weird questions, uh, Jimmy, uh, mm-hmm. Keith at, says this. All kidding aside, is there a parallel universe? And I just want to say, Keith, you don't have to start a question like that for Jimmy Aiken with all kidding aside. He's going to take that yeah, question seriously. I try to take every question seriously. Uh, uh, is there a parallel universe? So it um, depends on what you mean by that. And actually, it's funny you mentioned Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, one of mm-hmm. my other podcasts, because just today, today's episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is about parallel worlds. It's just came out today. Uh, just came out. Oh, today. Gotta, it's on, on the mystery of the multiverse. OK. And you can f- just type in Jimmy Akin Mysterious World. You can also look on YouTube. We've got a version of it there. You can go to SQPN.com, whatever, however you find it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, we, in terms of science, we don't know if there are parallel worlds or not. It is possible, and many scientists think it's probable. Some are even convinced of it, but we really don't have scientific evidence at this point. There's no way we can directly detect 
other worlds. And so consequently, um, it remains a matter of philosophical speculation from mm-hmm. a scientific point of view, not something we've been able to scientifically prove. In, on a, From a religious perspective, though, we have a little bit more information um, because God has revealed to us that there is an invisible spiritual world. Mm-hmm. Where, which is inhabited, for example, by angels, it obeys different laws than the ones that uh, are imp- that apply down here. Which is why angels can do supernatural things, you know, miracles and stuff. And um, and it, so it would seem that uh, depending on how you want to define your terms, you could say that heaven is a parallel world. Yeah. Um, So you could say we have at least a two universe multiverse, depending on how you want to define your terms. Now, if you if you define uh, universe to just mean everything that exists, well, then we're not going to have a multiverse because everything that exists is going to include both heaven and earth. But um, but, you know, that doesn't change the fact that within the set of everything that exists, there are these two very different realms. Right. The question is just what label do you want to put on those realms? Are they worlds? Are they universes? Whatever. Yeah. Um, But it does seem that the invisible world is real and that it is different uh, than our world, which is why it's invisible. Duh. Because um, ours is visible. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, you'll notice I mentioned heaven in that regard. I didn't mention purgatory and hell. The reason is purgatory and hell could just be states within the invisible world. Oh. Um, so it's it's kind of like here uh, in the material world, we have, you know, different planets or, and different regions of planets like North America versus South America. Um, and it could be that. Purgatory and hell, since they're inhabited by the same kind of beings, angels and departed human souls, Mm -hmm. they could all be part of one overall realm. Yeah. Um, And so they could be regions within that spiritual realm or they could be separate uh, uh, realms. They also could just they might not be like geographical regions, but spiritual conditions within that uh, that spiritual realm. So, for example, in Spasalvi, his encyclical, Pope Benedict XVI uh, proposed, but did not require as a matter of doctrine, the idea that the fire of purgatory is an encounter with the fiery love of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so in that case, purgatory would be like a spiritual condition yes, in right. the afterlife rather than a location right. in the afterlife. On the other hand, we should note that because some people have their bodies with them in heaven, like Jesus and Mary, yeah. and maybe Enoch and Elijah and Moses, um, that it seems that this state, this spiritual world is at least capable of receiving uh, physical bodies they may not manifest in the same way they would manifest here on Earth, but it seems that it's at least capable of receiving uh, physical bodies. And so consequently, it interacts with our world in a kind of interesting way that it's capable of including material things, but it also goes beyond the normal material operation of things. Uh, I hope that was satisfying. Uh, Keith, appreciate that question. Are there any, like, I, I, I hate to keep adding to people's questions, but this mm-hmm. just occurs to me. Are there any, uh, like, uh, theories of parallel universes that you would say, that no, no, that can't be, that's incompatible with the faith? Have you heard any of those? Or? Um, well, it, not in principle. Okay. I can, but I mean, there are certain, like, say, imagine a world where God does not bring evil, does not bring good out of evil. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's not going to exist because that's incompatible with God's nature. Oh, Um, yeah. It might not be physically impossible, but God's not going to create that kind of world. Right. Right. Got it. Oh, by the way, one other thing regarding uh, the spiritual realm. We do have some indication that um, there may be more than one heaven. You know, you've heard the right. expression seventh heaven that actually goes back to very ancient uh, Jewish and Christian literature. Um, there's a, a document from the first century called the a Christian document from the first century called the Ascension of Isaiah, where the prophet Isaiah is depicted as being given a, a kind of tour 
of the spiritual world where he ascends first through the firmament. That's the air yeah. uh, above earth. And then he goes up through seven heavens to see where uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit and, and uh, the Father are. And then he descends back through these realms um, to watch and watches Jesus uh, in his vision uh, become incarnate. And so um, we don't have a biblical reference to the seventh heaven, but we do have St. Paul referring uh, in Second Corinthians to being caught up to the third heaven. Right. So it, what he means by that, it doesn't have to mean that there's three layers to heaven in the afterlife. Some people have proposed that, well, maybe the first heaven is the air, yeah. the atmosphere. The second heaven is the realm of the stars and the third heaven is the realm of the angels, Yeah. in which case... We have two of the heavens being physical and only one spiritual. But on the, if you look at this background, um, yeah. it it you know could well mean that there are multiple heavens, and those could be construed as as multiple different uh, worlds or or universes. Uh, Keith, again, thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's <clears throat> weird questions day with uh, Jimmy Aiken here on uh, Catholic Answers Live. Second hour, actually, Carlo Broussard will be here. Uh, so this hour is weird questions with Jimmy Aiken. Uh, Matthew says, if we discovered extraterrestrial life, mm -hmm. would we evangelize them? Or only teach them the cardinal virtues? Well, we could certainly evangelize them in terms of telling them what God has done for our race. Mm -hmm. So we could share the good news of Jesus with them. The question would be, how do they relate to the good news? Mm -hmm. um, do they even need to be saved? Maybe they're an unfallen race and are not in need of redemption. If they are in need of redemption, then would um, would the redemption of Christ cover them? Um, now, it's not a question of it, did Christ pay enough on the cross to cover them? He did. He made infinite satisfaction. And so consequently, it would cover any number of sins committed by any number of species. But the question would be, does God mean it to apply to these folks? And that's a decision for God to make. Um, it would ultimately require the study of theologians and eventually a, a magisterial decision by the church to settle the question for sure. But I think an indicator uh, would be, um, do the aliens want to have Christ's redemption applied to them? If they do, the presumptive answer would be that it can be. Um, this is related to the situation of oh. the angels, because the angels who fell um, are not redeemed. But the reason for that, they're not able to be saved. But the reason for that is they don't want to be. Okay. One of the things that um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church points out is that God's, uh, God's mercy is not limited. The reason the angels who are fallen don't um, don't get saved is not because Jesus's sacrifice is inadequate to cover them, but because they, they don't, don't want, want it. it. Okay. And so if the aliens are fallen and say, oh, we don't want to be, we don't want to be saved. Well, then they're in the same category as the angels. Mm -hmm. But if they say, oh yeah, we want to be saved. Um, we, and we want, you know, to be saved through Jesus, then, um, then, then the presumption would be they can be. Yeah. Um, now, it's also possible, though, that they could have been saved uh, through other means because God might have a special different way for them to be saved, yeah. maybe involving an incarnation on their planet. All right. OK, so uh, uh, ultimately or, or at its base, then sharing uh, the good news or evangelizing is a matter of telling the story of what happened to us. Yeah. And then people can do what they. And if God has had dealings with them. That we can they could evangelize story. us, tell right. us what God did with them, but right. it wouldn't mean we need to be saved their way because God's already shown us the way that we need to be saved. Maybe they saw Elijah going by on his way. Maybe. To his <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe they left a place for him in case he comes back. <laughs> or no, was it Elijah or Isaiah that you said? Isaiah? No, Elijah. Elijah. Oh, Elijah, yeah. Oh, well, uh, Isaiah had the visionary ascent. That's yes. the one that, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, we saw that guy. He came by here. Mm -hmm. uh, weird questions with Jimmy Aiken today. Uh, so we'll take calls, I guess. But uh, for the most part, we're going to depend on the Internet ones because we know that they are genuinely uh, weird. Uh, Jimmy, let me give you another one here. Uh, mm -hmm. Jeremy asks, uh, what is the church's stance on ghosts, specters, and hauntings? Can a soul that's departed mm -hmm. this life 
stick around to, quote, haunt things that uh, things or can these be interpreted as demons trying to trick us? Well, the church doesn't have a stand on ghostly phenomena like hauntings. Um, it does have a stand on ghosts. They're real because ghost is just another word for spirit. And it teaches uh. that human spirits are real and do survive death. And sometimes God allows us to interact with them, like in the apparitions of the saints. Uh, we got the, I'm sure there's more on this. There's more on So that. we'll talk more about ghosts when we come back. Uh, so we were doing ghosts. Oh, we were doing ghosts. Yeah, yeah. right. So um, so English is a language that has this weird double vocabulary that's partly uh, Latin in origin and partly German in origin. Right. And so we tend to have two words um, for almost everything. That's why uh, we have uh, pigs and swine mm -hmm. and dogs and hounds and cats and felines. And it's also why we have ghosts and spirits. Because the German word Geist, ghost, is the same as the Latin, means the same thing as the Latin word spiritus or spirit. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, since we have spirits, both in the forms of angels and human spirits, um, we have ghosts. And sometimes God lets us interact with them. In terms of hauntings, now a lot of people, when they think they're being haunted, um, a lot of times there's a natural explanation. Yeah. Sometimes it could be a demon messing with them, but uh, it, it's not impossible that yeah. uh, God uh, would allow uh, either a saint or a soul in purgatory to manifest in some way to a person on earth, um, including in ways that could be mysterious. And actually, there's a tradition down through the centuries where people, Catholics, have reported exactly this, and it's been taken seriously. So it's yeah. not to be dismissed. If you want to learn more about that, uh, check out the very first episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, which is all about ghosts. Uh, all right. Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, who was that? It was Jeremy. And uh, this one's from Susan. Um, how can we square, square scientific discoveries of hominids, human-like beings, and their development uh, with the Adam and Eve story? So, uh, mm -hmm. so it's an evolution Adam yeah. and Eve story, and we know that there are... Uh, hominids other than ourselves uh, hominids right. even other than neanderthals all kinds yeah so how do we square that with the adam and eve story well it, there are multiple ways of doing it um one one way is by saying okay um you had these early populations of hominids that god was guiding you know their evolution and they would have had souls because Every living thing has a soul. The soul is yes. the life principle of the body. Other, if you if you don't have a soul, you're dead. Mm -hmm. um, as James says in James chapter two, the body without the spirit is dead. Mm -hmm. So they would have had souls, but they if they were pre-human, they wouldn't have had human souls, mm -hmm. and so their souls wouldn't have had full reason, and they wouldn't uh, might not have survived death. Um, because we know that that human souls have full reason and that they do survive death. We don't know about other souls. Yes. That's something that is a matter of theological speculation, right. not a matter of church teaching. And so uh, although a common opinion is that animal souls at least don't survive death, but again, that's theological speculation. Right. So in terms of uh, of mapping the known history of these hominids onto mankind, considered theologically speaking, it's a little hard to say where to draw the line. But presumably, as you know, God was guiding the development of these life forms. He was giving them souls that were uh, adequate and corresponding to their physical forms. Yeah. And so those souls would have been different at different times, just like, you know, the soul, even though lions and tigers are both, uh, you know, cats, yeah. they, the lion soul is not going to be the same as a tiger soul. Right. And so um, the uh, as these hominids developed, uh, God would have given them souls appropriate to their bodies. And then at some point when you had the first theological, theologically true human, God gave uh, that person the first true human soul. Okay. And um, and so uh, when in our history that would have occurred is a matter of debate. 
Um, it's not easy to draw lines between different species under any circumstances. Right. And it's especially not in these circumstances because we are missing so much information from back then. Um, it's possible that uh, Neanderthals could have counted as modern humans. It's possible, theologically speaking, even though they weren't our subspecies, they weren't Homo sapiens sapiens. But they may well have had uh, rational souls. Exactly. They, souls. they yeah. could have. We don't know. They might right. have just been similar, but not fully rational. Yeah. That's a question that's still up in the air. The same is true of other species or subspecies of man that we've that we know existed, like the Denisovians. Um, one reason to think that um, they might have been fully modern in the theological sense yes. is because we were able to breed with them. Uh, we know that humans, uh, based on looking at the human genome, we know that humans bred both with Neanderthals and with Denisovians and with a, a re recently discovered um, Neanderthal-Denisovian hybrid subspecies. Really? Yeah. Uh, the computer found that. We had an AI doing deep uh, pattern searching in the human genome and discovered, guess what? There used to be a Denisovian Neanderthal hybrid and we interbred with it. Thanks, computer. Yeah. So um, so it, it, it's a little unclear, you know, where to draw the line, but that's the seems the most plausible, basic way of reconciling all this. There are other questions you could ask, but in terms of the basic one, that's how I'd approach it. Uh, Susan, thank you very, very much for that question. I'm sure that many, many people have that question, too. Um, uh, Fabian, Fabian asks, uh, will those who have died and been buried on Mars miss out on the final resurrection? No. If we have people buried on Mars at the time the resurrection occurs, they will get to participate, too. Uh, the resurrection of the dead and the judgment of all the human dead is something that's a teaching of the faith. And so if you're a human and you're dead, then when Jesus comes back to judge the world, you're going to participate and you'll consequently get to experience uh, heaven if you died in God's friendship. And uh, you might not decompose, though. If they bury you on Mars. Well, it, it, you might not. Um, you know, it's not a lot of microbes. There. Not, oh, well, we don't know. I, was, I guess I was. Yeah, yeah don't, don't I assume the that. gun on that. Also, the uh, the the water on Mars may be like more acidic than it is here on Earth. And that could also decompose. So. Uh, I got it. But Fair it's enough. usually frozen. Uh, OK, so, that's good. So you don't have to get back to Earth to die if uh, you uh, that's already pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? You don't have to feel if you're on Mars and you're feeling sick. Don't worry about your immortal soul. Right. You'll I mean, still be raised and get to be in heaven if you're <laughs> uh, Fabian. I really appreciate you clearing that up. I I have doubts about whether I'll ever make it to mm -hmm. Mars. Well, there may one day be bishops on Mars. They may have have to make ad limina visits Excellent. back to Earth. Excellent point, Jimmy. Someone should write a book about that. I wish someone would write a book about a bishop making an ad limina visit. You could Mars. even call it ad limina. Yes, it would. But I could find it on Amazon right now at this very moment, Jimmy. You're all right. I appreciate that. No problem. Uh, Michelle asked this, Jimmy. Okay. I she says I was once asked if angels could appear as dogs and cats. Well, um, I would say yes. Angels can appear, of course, they don't have bodies themselves, but they can appear uh, as if they had human bodies. And um, so if they can do that, then I don't see why they would be limited to just human bodies. Um, it's not like they have a native shape. So any um, shape we see them in is an artificial one. And I would assume they could change their shape just like um, you could change the skin on an avatar. And um, in fact, in some of the visions that we see recorded in the Bible, they at least have animal parts. Uh, sometimes oh. you'll see like the cherubim will have, uh, you know, a head like an ox or a lion or oh, an right, eagle. Right. And they have wings, both them and the seraphim do. And so um, so consequently, they they're already displaying animal parts. They could go full animal if they wanted. They could go full animal. I like yeah. <laughs> the way. Is that a technical um a uh, theological term? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's in all the manuals. It's in the Summa, I think. It's in the Summa. Okay. I, got, I must have missed that part of the Summa. Uh, Heather asks, um, uh, 
binaural oh, wow. and sure. isochronic tones. Right. I was having trouble with my eyes for a minute. Okay. It is safe. Is it safe as far as a, from a st- spiritual uh, standpoint? Does the church have anything to say on these? I listen to them for sleep. Okay. So we should mention uh, first, because not a lot of people have heard of binaural beats or isochronic tones. Um, binaural Beats are uh, tones that are slightly different than each other, and you play one of them in your right ear and one of them in your left ear, and your brain combines them into a third tone. Um, Isochronic tones are tones that are... um, that are identical to each other and are put out at a certain frequency rate. So you might have 10 of them a second Uh that you hear. And there are claims that these are useful for uh, various health things like relaxation or getting to sleep or things like that. Right. Um, The church has no teaching on this. So it's going to be left up to to medical science, psychological science to sort out, um, you know, is there a real therapeutic effect that yeah. these have or not? Um, some people may have um, have uh, an effect that's due to the placebo effect, you know, um, and that's not to be dismissed. I mean, if you think, hey, this is going to help me relax. Well, even if it wouldn't help someone else relax, if you think it's going to help you relax and get to sleep, it may do that. Um, so whether the uh, relaxation and soporific or sleep inducing effects are intrinsic to these sounds or whether they're um, they're something that you need to have the expectation this is going to do it for me. As long as it works um, for you, there's not going to be an in principle problem okay. with it morally. And so I would say if it helps you get to sleep, you know, that's fine. Personally, I have Alexa read me audiobooks at night to help my brain from going around in circles. I, uh, I'm assuming uh, Whatever works Alexa is not a human. No, it comes no, over no, no, no. It's, it's the AI that lives on my nightstand. <laughs> ah, you have an AI living on your nightstand. Mm-hmm. I, uh, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, got, I got nothing for you. I thought I was going to have something better, but I got nothing. Heather, thanks for that question. Uh, Lauren, uh, what may the existence or non-existence of the Holy Grail mean for the faith? So the Holy Grail, as people will know, is the cup or that Jesus or chalice that Jesus used uh, at the Last Supper. And there have been claims that it was preserved um, down through history. And some people have even famously gone on quests to find it. Um, There are actually some candidates uh, that have been proposed as the Holy Grail that uh-huh. you could go see today. Um, whether any of them are real is something that I uh, am skeptical of, although, to be honest, I haven't looked into the data, so I haven't tried to check out the provenance of these artifacts. Okay. Um, I do think it's somewhat unlikely that we would still have the original cup that Christ used um, after all this time. And given that um, the the urge to treat it as a relic would not have developed immediately. Oh, yeah, I see. Um, so now if 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 someone had it for us today, it would be awesome and we would immediately preserve it and stuff. Yeah. But right. um, but back then it, it was a cup that Jesus happened to use at Passover. They might have used it at the next Passover for typical Passover wine that wasn't even consecrated. Um, we don't. So we don't know. Um but if it did exist, it would be cool. It would be something that um, that would show a special sign of God's providence and care for future generations, his love for future generations who would have this impulse to treat it as a relic, and it would satisfy that impulse. Yeah. Um, so it would be a nice thing that God could do, but not something he would be obliged to do. Um, one thing to keep it kind of keep it in perspective is every single chalice used at every single mass holds the precious blood. Ah, And so um, it's not like the Holy Grail is unique. Uh, The Holy Grail is unique in the sense that it was the first one. Right. And that Jesus himself used it. But it's not unique in the sense of it's the only vessel that ever holds the precious blood. Ah, that's very okay. Very, very interesting. Um, uh, Let's go to Paul. I'm just going to try to work through some here. Uh, If limbo does exist... As the afterlife unbound, oh, 
as the afterlife for unbaptized infants. Mm-hmm. Are they aware of their status? As being in limbo yeah, as opposed not to being heaven? In heaven. Yeah. Um, well, we don't really know. Um, limbo, number one, may not exist. The idea of limbo for people who may not be aware is that it's a theological speculation to account for where children and others who die without baptism but who also don't have personal sin— um, you know, children who die very yeah. young, stuff like that. They've never committed a personal sin because they don't have the reason to do so, the capacity of reason to make that kind of choice. So they shouldn't experience punishment right. in the afterlife. But they also, without baptism, don't it's they don't have the guaranteed way to get God's grace into your soul. Right. So this is a speculation. Now, theologians have also said, well, God's not limited by the sacrament, so he could give his grace to people even without baptism. Um, but if he didn't, and so if there was a limbo where people would go um, – to uh, not experience punishment, but also not have the full glory of being united with God, then they could have a num- they could be in a number of different conditions. One of the speculations when limbo was a popular idea was that they would have great natural happiness, mm-hmm. just not the supernatural happiness of being fully united with God. Um, they're obviously partially united with God because everything is or it wouldn't exist. Yeah. Um, would they be aware that they were that there was a higher level of happiness that they didn't have? They could be because all of us who aren't the greatest human being ever yeah. are going to be aware that there is a higher level of happiness that we could have had. Um, but we're not going to resent that. We're not going to be pained by it. We're going to be grateful for what we do have. And the same would happen for uh, people in limbo who are aware there is a greater level of happiness. They're just going to be grateful for what they've got. Uh, thank you very much for that, Paul. Uh, Marino uh, says this, Jimmy, debunk flat earth. Many folks use Bible to prove flat, flat earth. So this is kind of a big question, uh, and I'm going to be devoting a future episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World to this because it is a big question. Um, <clears throat> from a religious perspective, the Bible uses the language of phenomenology, which means it describes things according to appearances. Uh Thus, it talks about the sun rising and setting because the sun appears to rise and set. It talks as if the earth is flat because from a terrestrial perspective on the surface of the earth, the earth is so big, it looks flat most of the time. Right. It also talks about the sky as if it's a bowl because the sky looks Looks like like a a bowl. bowl. It's been set on this flat plate. But all of this is just the language of appearances. Um, If you want to know whether it's literally true, you have to not just rely on these poetic descriptions, but do tests. And one of the classic tests was the fact that even in the ancient world, they could see when a ship is going over the horizon, the mast disappears last. It doesn't look like it's shrinking into the distance as a body. Uh Part of it goes down over this hill of water, and then eventually the top part of it goes down, thus showing the curvature of the Earth. Uh, Thank you very, very much to everybody who shared their weird questions. If you've got a weird question you'd like to ask Jimmy, just send it to us at radio at catholic.com. Jimmy Aiken, thanks for all your service this week. My pleasure. Thanks for a very weird hour. My pleasure. Wasn't that weird? See you next Uh, week. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, so, Jimmy, what is the subject of our next episode? Our next episode, we're going to be talking about dark matter, dark energy, and the case of the missing universe. Boom, boom, boom. All right. Well, folks, please, if, if you want to uh, send us your feedback, you can do so by going to sqpn.com slash mysterious or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or you can send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Until next time, Jimmy Akin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>